to start these things. Um, thank you all for coming to the 75th JavaScript talk at RailsConf. Um, I have seen some really great presentations this uh, week so far. Did anyone see the Three Mile Island uh, disaster presentation? Uh, I really liked that one. I think I had really great slides. Um, my slides are not great. Um, so let me introduce myself. My name's uh, Graham Konzett. I've been a software developer for uh, 10 or 15 years. Um, and I really want to leave time at the end of this for questions or discussion. I've run through this presentation a couple times and it's always right up until the, the wire. So I'm going to try and go quickly because um, I want to talk to everybody. Um, I don't do Twitters, but uh, I do have a GitHub. And because it's RailsConf, this presentation is actually a Rails project. Um, so you can clone it right now, uh, go follow along. Um, It'll save me some time from having to alt tab between demos and uh, slides. That does mean I have to click the buttons at the bottom though. Um, hopefully that makes up for my bad quality slide layouts. Okay. Um, so before we talk about what uh, I mean by old school JavaScript, um, I wanted to provide some background as to why you might want to go down this road. Um, and this is not a modern JavaScript sucks talk. It's not a like React is terrible. Um, it's more about um, you know picking the right tool for the right job. There's no no silver bullet. Um, I'm actually heavily involved in the React user group in Columbus um, and used it on several large projects. Um, I actually do like JavaScript. Um, so story time. Um, I work for a company called Orange Barrel Media. Um, they're out of Columbus, Ohio. Um, they are, it says advertising in there, and when you think of advertising in the tech space, you probably think of Google, uh, AdWords, that kind of thing. Um, but we are actually a large format outdoor advertising company. Um, we're also hiring. If you're a kick-ass front-end developer, we're looking for you. Come see me afterward. Um, so you might be wondering why a outdoor advertising company would deploy software developers. Um, and that's because we also operate and uh, have these interactive kiosks. Um, and they're kind of like giant location aware um, content aggregators. Um, as you can think it's a giant iPad sticking out of the ground. Um, but it does have local content um, and events that the, the cities manage um, and, and coordinate. Um, and the, the little operating system that you see, um, maybe you can kind of see um, on the screen there, is just kind of the tip of the iceberg. We have lots of content. There's lots of content that uh, cities and admins um, have to manage. Um, um, so, story continues. Um, recently, we've had a lot of growth in this area, and we have kind of an old, uh, you know, couple year old Rails app. Um, that served the uh, back end well when it was really tiny. Um, but our team is growing and the uh, Rails back end um, wasn't quite cutting it anymore. We are using an admin framework um, and it was good because it let us focus on features, um, gave us a consistent user interface, um, some nice UX niceties, and by niceties I mean things like uh, drag and drop, um, undo, copying, those sorts of things. Um, but it was becoming really inflexible for what our users and admins wanted to build. Um, and another, you know, there's other sad things about it too, like we have lots of dependencies and plugins and it's hard to upgrade Rails when you have 15 admin panel dependencies. Um, so we went looking for something else and we wanted to, um, you know, still keep all the stuff we liked about the admin framework, um, the top three green check marks. Um, but see if we can do better in the other areas. Um, so after going back and forth, we're like, let's just use Rails. Um, so this is uh, Rails comp talk, that makes sense. Um, Rails provides a lot of what we need out of the box. Um, so here's my little vanilla ice cream cone there, just plain vanilla Rails. Um, it lets us focus on features still, and by features I mean the stuff that uh, ends up in the operating system on the front end of those kiosks. Um, it provides a consistent user face, in user interface in the form of whether we're bringing in like a bootstrap or a component library 
or just relying on partials. Um, so that's nice. And obviously it's flexible and we can build anything we want for our users. Um, the question mark was around these UX niceties. If we're, if we're just sticking with vanilla rails out of the box, uh, how do we get those nice drag and drop, um, you know, that sort of WYSIWYG style stuff that users have come to expect, really. Um, so we were wondering how far we could get with just the JavaScript library that Rails itself provides. Um, modern browser support has come a really long way, um, and you know you might not have to bring in a React, an Angular, um, what have you, to get the job done. Um, so what do I mean by old school? Um, this is what I have dubbed the, the sprinkle continuum um, of JavaScript frameworks. Um, and in a nutshell, um, since we're just using the out of the box UJS library that Rails has to provide this functionality, um, old school in the context of this talk is about using the Rails request response lifecycle with some JavaScript that's executed um, when the page re-renders um, to get what you want in terms of those UX niceties. Um, so we're not even using jQuery, as you can see. Um, there's nothing that stops you from using ES6 or Babel or anything like that. And even ES5, it's more about you know, leveraging some of the modern browser technologies and uh, you know, it really depends on what your target audience is. So I'm gonna call it ES, what works in your users' browsers or whatever works best for your users. Um, some of you who have used Rails for a long time probably remember um, RJS. Um, and that was kind of dropped or supplanted by UJS, and um, I won't go into that too much, um, but basically that was writing Ruby code to execute JavaScript on the client, and we'll be doing a little bit of that um, in these demos. All right, so um, this is a basic example. This is sort of a um, contrived version of what one of our um, admin panels for displaying posters that rotate on the front of those kiosks. Um, basically we have a playlist, is what we're calling it, and these uh, posters inside of it are called playlist items. And basically they, they get a duration and an order for uh, how long they show. Um, this is just a very basic HTML version where we've been building on it um, throughout the talk. So select list, um, you can pull up things to do, add it to the list, you can delete it, and you can see that the page um, is refreshing each time. Um, this is all just vanilla rails under the hood so far. Just basic model view controller, um, nothing fancy. So let's take a look at the controller real quick just to uh, prove that. Um, can you all read that? Probably not. Um, so this is the same controller for all the examples. And the only thing we really added is this uh, format JS call here um, in our respond to block. Um, and that's just because by default in Rails, uh, when you're using these um, remote asynchronous actions, um, it'll just call the, uh, you know, the HTML format block. And we wanna do special stuff. Um, so this should all be fairly familiar to everyone. Um, there's uh, some to-dos in there, but it's just the, a few basic actions um, that now have the format JS block on there. All right, so I kind of lied in the first example. Um, remote create is actually in Rails by default now. Um, when you use form with in uh, Rails 5, um, you actually have to specify a local true in order to make it just use basic HTML post anymore. Um, so while that page was actually just a post redirect get loop, um, we had to make it do it out of the box. So. If you want your uh, form to be asynchronous, don't do anything anymore. It used to be you put uh, remote true in there, but form with does that by default. Um, let's see. Okay, so let's look at stuff that is new in here. Um, taking a look at the uh, create JS ERB um, file that comes back, um, we're basically gonna render our playlist item uh, and you'll see that special J character there. Um, that just is a escape, the shortcut for escape JavaScript. You may have seen that before. 
Um, so that's gonna build HTML that allows it to be inserted into um, the page when the request comes back. Um, we're gonna assign that to a variable and we're gonna stick it into um, the end of our playlist items list. Um, you notice that we're not using jQuery or anything here. Um, you know, once again, browsers have come a long way, so we can leverage things like insert adjacent HTML um, and things like query selector. So at the end here, you can see we're just um, adding the nicety of clearing the form once the user has submitted it. So let's take a look at what that looks like. It'll look pretty much like the other thing, except it's a little bit faster. Um, partially this demo is running um, locally, so even the HTTP version uh, with the redirect is gonna be fairly fast. Um, but basically what happens is that um, that response, that view gets executed and gets inserted into the DOM. You've probably seen this before, um, and I promise we'll get to uh, more detailed examples of leveraging this. Um, but you can see when we destroy it, it's still synchronous. Um, you saw a little flash of the page there. Um, we're gonna fix that up next. So looking at remote destroy, um, this is another one that's fairly common if you're reading through the Rails guides. Um, we're just going to change our delete link that we have in our partial there um, to have remote true. And this will submit it via um, Ajax now with a media type uh, that lets it know that it should respond with the JavaScript parcel. Um, so that's all you have to do there. We added a little bit of uh, disable with stuff and we'll go into that a little later. Probably familiar with that too. Um, so let's take a look at the, um, the actual view that we're rendering um, for our destroy. Um, and we're gonna introduce um, some helpers here. And uh, once again, we're using all of Rails, all of the Rails Buffalo. Um, and we use these partials quite a bit in our application. Um, you know, this hide, um, once it's deleted, is going to hide the item in the list, and then we're gonna render a flash message. Um, this is the part that I was, this strategy is most similar to um, RJS of old, um, and that is that we're actually using Ruby code to do JavaScript things. In this case, it's just partials that are uh, helpers and not um, a Ruby that's been transpiled to JavaScript. Um, so you can see here in our application helper, we've got this hide, and it's just um, returning a raw string that uh, finds our model by the DOM ID and sets it to display none. Um, DOM ID is a uh, helper included in Rails, if you're not familiar with it, um, that uh, just constructs an ID based on the model name and its ID from the primary key. So now, if we add our new item here, and we can delete it, and we'll notice that we have uh, nice flash messages and everything deleting uh, quickly. Once again, it might be hard to see the difference uh, because we're localhost and fast, um, but it is much faster and um, you know faster for the user uh, when they're working in there. All right, um, so the one thing we did uh, change is we added this render flash method as well. Um, and um, th I think this is worth pointing out because um, the, this is a pattern that keeps coming up where we're sort of sharing a partial between a, an HTML view and a, uh, a JavaScript view. And uh, this is useful because if you're, somebody has JavaScript disabled in this day and age, I don't know why they would, but it's a possibility. Or you just have pages that you might not necessarily want to have this functionality, you can still share the partials between um, your uh, code for the JavaScript rendering or server-side rendering. Um, Surrender Flash just takes a partial that we've extracted um, and a uh, quark splat and um, render it and insert it into the flash container in the layout. Um, the flash container also calls the uh, partial here um, in the HTML. All right, so we're continuing with the CRUD theme. Um, this one is probably the most straightforward, but I couldn't leave it out since uh, you're already doing create and delete. And it's not really shown a whole lot in the Rails guides, um, but basically we're just changing the duration that we saw on the um, table to a form that we can update. Um, so we'll just put an inline form there. And you can see that uh, it's 
doing its remote thing. It's updated, and I can refresh the page here, um, show you that it actually updated, and not uh, just get the value. Cool. Sorry, some water here. All right. Don't fall asleep. I promise there's other cool stuff. Um, so we did add a view for the inline update, and basically all that did is render our special flash message um, to say, uh, yeah, it was updated. Um, the only reason I point this out is that um, there's, we don't always have, it's not always common to see views for things like create and update, especially if you're coming at it from a uh, JSON API based world, there's usually either like an empty body that's rendered or uh, you might just render the show view after you create, um, but we create all kinds of um, different views for uh, doing the different stuff you want to do based on user actions. All right, finally something a little different. Um, we're going to look at soft deletes. Um, so I'm going to take a little bit of a, a digression here to talk about soft deletes in uh, REST. And uh, I mean, this is Rails after all, so we're, we're embracing all of Rails, including REST and, and HTTP. Um, so we're gonna be adding a destroyed playlist items controller. And the reason we're gonna do this instead of just having an action that deletes or undeletes is that we kinda need to respect the, the 404 in, uh, in HTTP. If we delete um, an item, we shouldn't be able to go back and refresh it and have that ID still return uh, 200. It should be gone. Um, however, how do we delete it via or undelete it via REST API if um, you know we can't find it anymore? Um, and the solution that I like is just to add a different controller, a different route. Basically, treat these as different resources now. Um, and consider them deleted playlist items. So you, if you have un, you know, an undelete functionality across the bulk of your app, you might have numerous undelete controllers. And uh, DHH would be proud, no SQL here. Um, we're just finding all of the uh, playlist items that are not destroyed um, to set and the uh, playlist item. And then the, in our strong parameters, the only thing we're permitting is a uh, destroyed at timestamp. Now, probably want to make this a virtual attribute in real life, but for the sake of the demo um, and simplicity, just went with that. Um, so the undo functionality itself in the UI, um, basically when we destroy an item, we're going to modify our um, flash message, actually, um, to return a special button. And what the button does is it will actually be a, a remote function that updates the record. And you can see that here highlighted in the uh, second argument here. We're gonna be passing destroyed at nil to reset uh, and essentially undelete the playlist item. Um, you'll see we're passing a method patch, so this link essentially updates it. And then, if you remember back to our render flash message, there was a, um, you could pass in and override the partial that um, uh, you were passing into it. So here we're sending a special undo partial, uh, which includes a link that appears over on the uh, right to do this. I'm gonna demo that here in a second. So, uh, we can kill off Cityscape here, and you'll see that we now have our undo method rendered here. If we hit that, it'll say undone, it's back in there, it's sent a patch, it's updated the record, and it provides a very nice um, you know, user experience, similar to like a Gmail where you undelete something. Um, so, so far we have quite a bit of nice functionality going on with very little JavaScript written, um, no frameworks and not even uh, any jQuery. Um, so, if you notice the flash message there, um, we have, uh, it's saying specifically undone, and um, because we have a unique controller representing uh, this action, that gives us the opportunity to sort of customize what we say um, in response to a user doing this. Um, so in the update view um, for the destroyed playlist item, all we basically do is say it's undone, and then we're gonna call our show helper to basically unhide um, or uh, reveal any uh, deleted record that was hidden as part of the delete. So that's why we hit it before instead of actually removing it from the DOM. All right. Um, so, 
the next thing we wanted to bring over into the CMS um, was this notion of copying. Um, there are a lot of repetitive tasks in here and wanted to find a way to make sure that users could um, perform those actions um, you know, easily but not have to you know, repeatedly type stuff in. Um, so this is the first time we're gonna dip into sort of the, the model layer to add some functionality. And um, basically we're gonna just add a, a simple function that returns a hash of attributes that you want to copy. Um, and you can actually add this to your application record as well and just by default grab a model's attributes and get rid of the timestamps, get rid of the primary keys and uh, that's usually good enough for most of them and you can override that in your different models as needed. Uh, in the case of our playlist items, we just need to copy the duration and the poster ID. Um, so the changes that we'll make to uh, the playlist item itself, and it seems a little complicated, but we basically just have a, another button that we're uh, creating a record with an action here. Um, and we're passing in those parameters um, that, we've, that we're grabbing off of our record to copy. Um, once again, just changing the method to create, because all we're really doing is creating a new copy of that record with um, the attributes that we've specified. Uh, so this is really simple, similar to the undo functionality in a lot of ways, um, just a different um, set of parameters that's dynamic and a different method. Um, let's see here. Cool. So we can add the button here, uh, we can copy it. Copy, 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 and let's see our delete functionality still there. Oops, we went too far, and undo. Um, so a word of warning on the copying stuff, um, obviously this only works in cases where you have a very limited number of attributes. It's very easy to go overboard, especially with deeply nested structures and start ballooning the uh, front end HTML code uh, for every item there uh, with all of the potential properties you wanna, wanna copy. So uh, use judiciously, um, but it can provide a really nice user experience. Okay, so we get into reordering I mentioned. Um, and this is the first time we're really gonna do some, some more custom JavaScript here. Um, I'm gonna focus more on the approach than the JavaScript itself. Um, the playlist items, there's a requirement that they need to be reordered. Uh, so we could reach for a plugin, uh, a jQuery or something like that. Um, or you know, build something you know, crazier in React. But as we mentioned earlier, browsers have come a long way, it's 2018, and we have a lot of built-in functionality for dragging and dropping. Um, so uh, we're gonna follow kind of a similar pattern that uh, the Rails UJS library itself uses, um, which is uh, adding additional functionality to an HTML element based on data dash attributes. Um, so here we've just, we've given a, a URL to our uh, table body of playlist items here, and that's gonna be used by our, our JavaScript code to know where to post this reordering update to. Um, you notice that this, um, in the back end, we've been ordering these based on uh, position here. Um, the, the ordering is actually done on the server side, um, so we already know there's a, a position attribute on the playlist item. Um, and we won't forget to make our um, playlist item uh, itself draggable. Um, so here, if this works, um, you can see that they're now draggable and properly return a reordered flash message when you reorder it. Um, so this is one of those examples that wouldn't really be possible without the um, usage of sort of that request response lifecycle pattern. And that's because when you update a, a playlist item's position on the back end, um, we're gonna make sure that all the other playlist items are kept in order and updated as well. Um, so when you reorder one of these, it's going to re-render the entire table to make sure it's consistent and in sync. Um, now that's one way to do it, there's several other ways, but you often run into issues um, doing client-side reordering. Things can get out of sync, someone can come along and update something um, on the back end while you're working on the front end, um, different things like that. So while it's, it's less performant to update all the records, if you have a limited subset like we do, um, it could be nicer to do it on the back end and just re-render this whole view uh, when you change one record. So that's what we're gonna look at next. Um, 
So this is a little bit more verbose than it needs to be, um, but I kind of left it in because I wanted to show that even when it's bad, it's not that bad. Um, so we have this, um, an if else block here, and basically the if is gonna check to see if um, that record um, changed, or the position changed after it was updated. Um, if it has, um, we're gonna re-render the entire list of records and then stick them into the table so that we know we have a consistent view of all of the records that, um, uh, and their order. So if somebody <clears throat> came along and um, updated, if two users were in the system updating something on the back end and somebody reordered something, the whole list would be refreshed and they would make sure they would see the correct order. Um, down here at the bottom, um, that part of that if else block, um, basically if it's changed, we're gonna render a custom flash that says it's reordered, and if not, we're gonna ignore it and just say it's updated. Um, for example, if we updated the duration. Um, we do also need to call make reordable, make reordable again in uh, our implementation, um, and this is because we've replaced the entire um, DOM element here. Um, we uh, need to make sure that our, our hand-rolled UJS function goes back and applies all that stuff to it again, which is what we'll look at next. Um, the actual reorderable JS code, um, this is mostly just to demonstrate the, <laughs> the boilerplate that you need to set up for um, drag and drop in general in HTML. The API is um, a little weird. Um, so basically this make reorderable function just finds that data dash reorderable um, and adds the requisite drag start, drag over, and drop events. Um, you see that on drop we have a reorder here. Um, that's a function that's not shown in this page, um, but all that really does is um, kick off a, the Ajax call to the back end to update that playlist item, and we're actually reusing the Rails UJS Ajax wrapper there, um, but I didn't have space to squeeze it in here, so. Um, but you have the code, so you can go and look at it. So this is getting towards the end of um, what I wanted to demo. I did have some, I cut some of this stuff for time, because like I said, I wanted to you know, do questions and discussion and go over a few other things uh, before I wrapped up. Um, I did start going down the path of trying to implement a combo box um, with HTML5 uh, data list component. Um, would love to talk about that. It's kind of interesting, but the API is also a little strange. It's not exactly like a combo box. Um, so there are some things you have to change and fix up on the back end um, in, in Rails to kind of make it work, but you can still provide a nice out of the box kind of type down Ajax based experience that uh, users have come to expect there uh, without bringing in plugins or libraries or anything like that. So leaning on standards um, once again. Um, so the next piece I wanted to touch on um, before we move on, and this is um, one of the shortcomings of using this request response lifecycle format um, is that you are going to the server every time for um, you know, making round trips to update your, your client uh, page. Um, and that can be very slow, and while we're on a fast local network here, um, it doesn't always, um, it doesn't look as, as sharp and as crisp um, if you're you know, on a bad connection or a mobile um, bad network or anything like that. Um, however, uh, in adding a lot of the um, helpers and the, the UJS stuff with the, the remote creates, we um, did take care, you may have seen, to add some of the um, data attributes that um, sort of replace text and um, let the user know that there's an action happening um, while we're doing these changes. Um, so let me just go ahead and drop my network down here. Let's see. Slow 3G sounds about right. And that will make my actual slide transition slow. Um, So you'll see when we deleted them, it was probably too fast to notice before, um, but, oh, well, that was unexpected. Did, I, did I, can closing dev tools do that? Hold on, that may have been out of this. Yeah, sorry. Um, 
So deleting something now on a really slow 3G network, you can see um, we added three little dots. That could be a spinner or an icon or something that's says loading. Um, but it's important to give that feedback to the user uh, because while most of the time it's gonna be fast and responsive, um, there are going to be um, times where it isn't. So um, the nice thing is that Rails takes that into account with a lot of its UJS stuff and um, it's just important to remember to add all of those uh, to each one. So, um, cool. Let me turn it back on there. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk about is uh, what we didn't do um, and showcase in here. Um, obviously a lot is the answer, um, but that's kind of why I want to um, talk with people and um, you know, have some discussions around what, uh, what are some really hard um, you know, UI, UX stuff um, that we think we can only do with single page apps that we might be able to do with this sort of old school style uh, request response lifestyle cycle JavaScript. Um, obviously single page apps or mini single page apps within a larger app are still king in terms of um, rich interactivity. Um, if I was gonna build Photoshop in the browser, obviously this would not be the way I was going to do it. Um, and you did notice there are a few other things that we didn't touch on that are um, still covered under, under the request response lifecycle sort of approach and that would be things like paging, sorting, and filtering. Um, and intentionally omitted those because there's a lot of edge cases that um, happen around you know, merging parameters for filtering and sorting, um, messing with the state of the uh, URL and the address bar, and I've gone down that path and it just does not work out very well um, in terms of providing um, a better user experience. Um, so manipulating that all in JavaScript um, doesn't work as well. Um, or it's harder to do than the other stuff that we demoed here. Um, so recommendation there is to probably just use regular old um, uh, posts or you know, get to the server and rely on turbo links to smooth out some of the performance there for you. Um, it's much easier than trying to merge in all those parameters and keep track of paging and, and uh, that kind of thing. Um, okay, that is all I have. And I managed to be under time actually, so. Uh, thank you very much for watching another JavaScript talk at uh, RailsConf, and uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.